Tak fordi jeg måtte komme. Jeg er meget glad for at være her i dag. Uh, but truly, it is a wonderful honor to be back at DTU. I think this is my third or fourth visit here, and it's uh, um, always, always inspiring. And I always feel like the stupidest person in the room, <laughs> but that's okay. That's a good, that, that's a good thing because I, I, I truly am so inspired by the work that happens here every day. And just to give a couple of notes about why this is so important to me, and I think that. Uh, uh, so I've had the privilege of, I think, going to Greenland five times in my trip, in my in my time in Denmark. Uh, my sixth trip is actually in February, and two of the trips have been mostly science specific with um, uh, Susan Delia, who runs our science portfolio at the embassy. And um, during that time, we've uh, we've gone and uh, observed NASA scientists, NSF scientists doing work. Um, that not that many people know about, frankly. And that we want to do everything we can to tell people about. Um, because it's critical work. It's work that's actually saving the planet. It's research that I think benefits, uh, benefits communities worldwide. Um, and frankly, it's just uh, it's exciting to watch. And it's interesting to watch. Uh, so this is why I think our partnership with DTU, our relationship with DTU, um, NASA's presence, all of it, uh, the relationship between their two countries, frankly, uh, is so important and why I really wanted to be here today. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so when I was born in 1974, terms like moonshot and shoot for the stars and one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, those are all part of the American DNA. They were part of our lexicon. It's what made us who we are. I was born on August 5th. That was the day that Neil Armstrong was born as well. He was born a few years before I was. But this was, this was actually one of those things that I used to brag about as a kid. Um, you know, they, these sorts, this sort of vision is what we as Americans were really driven by. And um, and let's not forget that during those times of moonshots, we were still in the middle of a variety of different international crises. This was during Vietnam. This was during the height of the Cold War. And we still did it. The international community, of course, still supported it as well. And I just want to say that because I think in this day, when I think so often we forget to be aspirational sometimes, we forget to shoot for the stars. And I don't mean average people. I think average people are always wanting to shoot for the stars, but I think sometimes our governments and our societies don't do enough to push that initiative. Um, and I think we, all, frankly, all need to be doing more. As I know, the people in this room are always doing more. So when I hear, you know, even everything from the president say to the, the union last week where he used a moon, the term moonshot a few weeks ago, Use, use the term moonshot in order to cure cancer, or the stuff that we're going to be talking about today, can we live on Mars? Are we alone? Let us continue to invest in this kind of curiosity <coughs> as a way to make ourselves better, our communities better, and our countries greater. So that's why I think I'm so excited to be here. And I will now introduce our very, very special guest. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to do it. Uh, Dr. Ellen Sofan, um, an inspiring and impressive scientist who believes answers to the questions that I just raised uh, can be discovered within our lifetimes. Dr. Sofan is the chief scientist of NASA and serves as a principal advisor to NASA Administrator Charles, Charles Bolden on the agency's science programs, planning, and investments. Dr. Sofan has received many awards and honors, but I would like to mention in particular her Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. By background, Dr. Sufan is a planetary geologist with a master's and doctorate degrees, and I'm a little bit biased on this one because it's all, all my alma mater as well, Brown University in Rhode Island. Um, her appointment as chief scientist in 2013 marked a return to NASA for her. From 1991 to 2000, she held a number of senior scientist positions at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, in Pasadena, California, including chief scientist for NASA's New Millennium Program, deputy project scientist for the Magellan Mission to Venus, an experiment scientist for SIRC, an instrument that provided radar images of Earth on two shuttle flights in 1994, 
Uh, in addition to an impressive resume, Dr. Sofan is a strong advocate for STEM education and is a trailblazer for women in science. And I think you can now understand why I always feel like I'm the stupidest person in the room when I'm introducing amazing people like this. So thank you so much, Dr. Sofan, for coming to Denmark. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here, and I, for one, am thrilled. I'm very excited to listen to your presentation. So welcome. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, DTU for having me here today. I'd like to thank the American Ambassador for, uh, for introducing me and, of course, for the Embassy uh, for hosting my visit here. You know, it's, it's really a pleasure for me to get, well, it's always, this sounds terrible, it's always a pleasure to get out of Washington, D.C., um, where you know, we spend a lot of time on things like this budget um, and, and talk about the exciting work that, that we do. because. What we are doing, and by we I really mean the international community of, of space scientists, what we are doing is nothing to me short of amazing. And, and sometimes when you're involved in paper reviews or, or a project or building an instrument, you forget to step back and say, I'm exploring the universe. I'm at answering fundamental questions. I'm in an era where discovering planets around other stars has become something that's commonplace. And so I think it's, we're truly in the midst of an incredible era of exploration and discovery that it's hard to see sometimes because we're so sitting in the middle of it. Um, at NASA, obviously, we have sort of three major uh, focuses. We look out into the universe, trying to understand its origins and evolution. We look out at our solar system. We look at our sun. Uh, we look down, of course, um, at our own planet. Uh, and then there's all the research that I'll get to towards the end of the talk that we do every day up on the International Space Station uh, with all of our partners. This is an image um, from a new camera that we have called the EPIC camera, and it's on the DISCOVER satellite, which is a satellite, uh, space weather satellite from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, from the U.S. Um, the EPIC camera, so we, it sits out at, I mean, always get sorry, it's L1 or L2. So it gets this full disk image of the Earth every day. So if you're ever bored or feeling like you need inspiration, go to the Epic, Epic Camera website, and it very famously, um, sometime last year, captured the moon uh, photo bomb that the moon passed in front of the Earth um, for some really amazing footage. But I also wanted to put this up because obviously understanding the Earth is really one of the primary focuses of NASA, trying to understand what is going on on this planet? How can we characterize the atmosphere, the interior, uh, the interaction of our atmosphere with the solar wind to try to understand what's happening right now on this planet and what is potentially happening in the future? And obviously what we've seen, and this is the deviation, this is just from 2010 to 2014, the deviation uh, in average surface temperature. It's obviously no surprise to any of us that the planet has been getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And if we included the data from 2015 in this, uh, which was now just the warmest year on, on record bar 1998. So an incredible change taking place um, in an incredibly short amount of time. I was up at the uh, Arctic Frontiers Conference um, just two days ago, uh, talking to all the Arctic uh, nations, people that are doing research up in the Arctic. And, and I asked, the question I got asked was, what was the thing that was most surprising to me at this point uh, about the Arctic? And I said, look, you know, I'm a geologist. And for geologists, when we talk about things happening on rapid time scales, you know, 10 million years is something that freaks a geologist out. You know, oh my god, that's mind-blowingly fast. When you look at the rate of change of what's taking place in the Arctic, um, it, it obviously is something that's a huge concern. And, and obviously, as you well know, uh, as the planet has warmed, the warming has been more intense in the Arctic, causing that, that rapid rate of change that the rest of the planet really needs to be paying attention to. And, and that's why, to some extent, if you look at something like the International Space Station, where we have all the countries of the world, or if not all, but many countries of the world, cooperating in a peaceful way to move science forward, the Arctic is another area where all the nations that are, are uh, touch the Arctic uh, and many of the, uh, others who are interested in it, having them work together to really understand what's happening in the Arctic, how can we work with the peoples who live in that region uh, to make that area prosper, 
uh, but to also let us know how the changes in that area are affecting the rest of us on the planet. Now, how do we do that at NASA? Obviously, our role is to measure things. So we have right now uh, 19 satellites in operation uh, around this planet. A and again, when I go back to that we, we do this in partnership with other US government agencies, for example, the US Geological Survey, NOAA. Uh, and of course, we do it with all of our space agency partners. So all the data I'll be showing you today don't just come from US spacecraft, they come from the wide range. Obviously, all those spacecraft are measuring different things, different wavelengths, different orbits, uh, depending on what we're interested in. For example, just this past year, we launched a satellite called the Global Precipitation Measurement Core that now in combination with the other worldwide network of precipitation measuring satellites, we can understand, we can measure precipitation around the globe every three hours. And not only that, we know if it's ice, snow, <coughs> rain, and we even know the particle size of, of the droplets. Obviously, this is really critical going back to the climate change issue. Because think of precipitation uh, as being a proxy for energy moving around the weather system. So understanding where that energy is going, where it's being distributed uh, around the globe is really critical for understanding weather uh, and climate. And that's just one of the satellites up on that image. Obviously for our satellites in polar orbit, trying to measure what's going on up in the polar regions is really critical. And, and in combination, and I was just seeing today some of the in situ measurements um, that you guys are making up in Greenland um, is really critical to combine with the satellite measurements so that we can get both the, the view from space and broader regional trends, combine that with, with ground measurements to really calibrate and validate the data and try to understand what's happening. And as you well know, the story of Greenland, and this is gravity data from our, our GRACE satellite, uh, the data has been fairly alarming. The amount of ice loss off of Greenland, the acceleration of melt there, because of those rising temperatures, uh, has been uh, quite surprising. When you combine that with the same situation going down in, on down in West Antarctica, uh, where we have probably irreversible uh, collapse now of some of the large ice sheets, um, we're talking about another sort of half meter uh, minimum sea level rise due to the contribution of ice into the oceans from, from these two regions something that really wasn't factored into the IP, the International Panel on Climate Change reports, uh, which were mostly focusing on thermal expansion of the oceans because of the fact the ice bridge data, the cryosat data, all the data hadn't been fully uh, factored into those reports. So alarming change going on in the Arctic that we, all of the Arctic nations need to keep a close eye on. And obviously, for all of you, what's happening in Greenland is especially critical. The sea ice up in the Arctic um, is obviously also, every summer now, less and less ice up in the Arctic. The top globe is uh, from 1979, the front one is from 2012, and what you're seeing there in those orange and red colors is showing the change in albedo, or the reflectivity of the ocean surface, um, due to loss of sea ice uh, in the summers. Um, as you, each year has gone by. And obviously that's a concern because when you have more and more dark ocean surface exposed in the summer, it absorbs more sunlight. That sunlight or that warm water then is pumping energy into our weather and climate systems in ways that we don't fully understand. So about a year and a half ago in the United States, the National Academy of Sciences had organized a meeting to get people in to talk about, you know, what are the effects? You know, could some of these extreme weather events that we see in the Northern Hemisphere are they at all linked to the fact that you have so much more Arctic Ocean exposed uh, to sunlight in the summer? And we don't know the answer to that yet. We've had too short of a time frame of this going on, but we, you know, there's a lot of scientists who think there are links between what's going on. So we need to continue to collect this data. Sea ice extent, the thickness of the ice, um, both on land and on the sea is a critical parameter uh, to keep, keep trying to understand. The U.S. right now uh, relies mostly on Ice Bridge, our aircraft, uh, that goes up uh, to the Arctic at times of the year and it is in the Antarctic other time periods of the year, uh, but will eventually in 2017 launch ISAT-2. We lost ISAT-1 around 2007, so we'll launch ISAT-2 in a few years, and obviously in the meantime we also have cryosat uh, data. One of the other chief areas of concern that we have in the Arctic region is obviously the state of the permafrost. Uh, we've had two different aircraft campaigns uh, in the last uh, few years. 
uh, one of them called Above, that was looking at the Arctic boreal regions, and then the CARB, which was the, uh, looking at uh, carbon uh, uh, vulnerability in that area. But obviously trying to understand how much of the permafrost is melting, what the implications of that are for the atmosphere, especially in terms of methane release, is again an area that we don't completely understand that needs to be monitored carefully uh, in terms of really trying to understand uh, the rate uh, of, of uh, greenhouse gases, the rate of greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere. So an area of focus, I think, increasingly in the future for all the Arctic nations trying to understand uh, and, and gas release. In the United States, we have a group called IARPIC because we love acronyms. So IARPIC is the Interagency uh, Research Policy Committee. Because the Arctic doesn't just touch uh, so many countries of the world, it also touches so many different areas. You know, in the U.S. government alone, we have probably about 10 different federal agencies that have some aspect of Arctic research, whether it's on the state of the health of native people in the region, whether it's the state of fisheries, shipping, security. So just in the U.S. government alone, we have all these different players making investment. So IARPIC's function as a U.S. government committee, and I, I sit on IARPIC, is to say, what, what are we doing across the federal government? We're spending money, but are we doing it in the right way? Are we putting our research dollars in the right place to really leverage what's going on. There's a, a research strategy plan that uh, you can see on the web, and it focuses on those seven areas, trying to say, can we at least, within our country, coordinate the research efforts that we're doing up in the Arctic and make sure that we're proceeding in the best way possible? And then, obviously, through organizations uh, or events like the Arctic Frontiers Conference, through the Arctic Council, we try to work together as an international community to say, how can we make sure that we're, we're doing all the right things up there. Obviously, from NASA's perspective, you know, we're trying to make sure, are we making the right measurements? But I'll tell you, even from our perspective, the thing that we need even more of up in that region are actually in situ measurements. You know, we need on the ground measurements to help calibrate uh, the satellite data to really make sure that we understand what's going on, especially as weather forecasting up in that region, communications in that region become ever more critical, as well as really understanding um, sea ice extent. <clears throat> now, while the Earth is obviously a critical part of NASA's focus, obviously we're also <coughs> looking beyond. President Obama stated, has stated this goal up there that we want to have, by the 2030s, a human go to Mars and return safely to Earth. So at NASA, we are trying to make this happen. And I think we can actually do it. Now, we can't do it alone. At the time of Apollo, NASA was 4% of the US federal budget. We are now 0.47% of the US federal budget. So you know, we get skeptics. How can you guys even begin to think of being able to do this? Well, the world has changed. First of all, we have all that infrastructure, you know, Kennedy Space Center, Johnson Space Center. A lot of that money went to building infrastructure, huge amounts of infrastructure in the United States. That Some of it's a little rusty, but it's in, it's in good shape. You can use it. But the way we're going to do this is actually by working together as an international community. And there's something called the Global Exploration Roadmap that 16 space agencies from around the world are working together to say, how can we move humans beyond low Earth orbit, where we've been for so long and so working so successfully on the space station. How can we move beyond low Earth orbit? How can we get humans out to the vicinity of the moon and then eventually to Mars? And so we've taken this on as one of our, our basically our primary strategic goal at NASA. We want to expand human presence beyond low Earth orbit, where we've been for so long, and move outward into the solar system with the ultimate goal being, being Mars. And how are we going to do this? We're going to do it by working together as an international community. This isn't going to be NASA on its own. And also, ultimately, partnering with the private sector in ways that we have not done before. But I want to step back for a minute and go back to the why. Why are we doing this? Why is this important? It's going to cost a lot of money. Is this a good investment? So 
in the U.S., the way we develop policy about, about anything to do with our scientific research at NASA is done through the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So some of you probably know we put together what are called decadal surveys, and we do this in planetary science, astrophysics, heliophysics, earth science. We're about to start a new earth science decade. So the scientific community gets together and says, what are our priorities? What are the real measurements that need to be made? Where are the gaps in knowledge that we have a chance of answering in the next decade? And all of those reports, actually in some form or the other, contain some variation of those three questions at the bottom. Are we alone? How do we get here? And how does our universe work? To me, it's really all about origins and evolution. What is the or origin of the universe? How has it changed over time? What is the origin of galaxies, the origin of stars, the origins of us? How has it changed over time, and how can we use that information to understand our, our ultimate fate as the universe, the galaxy, the solar system continue to change? But if we go to that question of are we alone, which I think humans have wondered about since they were with humans, we sort of have two different areas of focus. The first one is our own solar system. Can we find evidence that life evolved in our solar system? Is there still extant life in our solar system? And for us, the search really begins with water. Obviously, life evolved here in the oceans on Earth. It remained in the oceans for a hugely long time period. It took billions of years for life on Earth to become at all complex. So we use that as a guide. Is it the right guide? Is the situation potentially more complicated than that? Do you really need water? We don't know, but at least let's start with what we know about the Earth. So when we go outwards, we say, where can we find stable liquid water environments? Because again, that stability is important if you want life to evolve and get it all complex so that you have a hope of finding it. So that drives us primarily to Mars. <clears throat> that's why Mars is the major target, and that's obviously uh, Mount Sharp. In the top center there, the, the Curiosity rover is, is, is currently climbing. And for geologists, then, we look at each of those layers of rock as Curiosity climbs Mount Sharp. And you're saying as a geologist, what can that layer of rock tell me about the history of Mars at that point in time? And what Curiosity has been telling us is that Mars was had water stable on its surface for long periods of time, and at least in the Gale Crater region, not too acidic, not too basic. And, and that's important, again, when we think about how life evolved here on Earth and, and the conditions it was under. And we have found some evidence of, of organic molecules on, on, this, on Mars with the Curiosity rover. You know, the problem is, though, obviously the surface of Mars, without Mars having a magnetic field, which it lost fairly early in its history, the surface of Mars is bombarded by radiation, which breaks organic molecules up. So what you're finding are fragments of organic molecules. So we're still not sure what those are telling us. Now our other targets are on the uh, upper right, Europa, uh, Jupiter's moon, thick icy crust, subsurface liquid ocean. You think of what Io looks like, Jupiter's other moon, the pizza moon with all the volcanoes. We strongly suspect, especially when you look at that cracked outer surface of Europa, that underneath that liquid ocean are probably active volcanoes. And that's important because when you look at white smokers, black smokers, volcanic vents on Earth's ocean surface, they're extremely rich environments for life. So the idea is, could there be life in Europa's oceans protected from the radiation environment by its thick icy crust? We don't know, we'd like to go find out. So in the mid-2020s, we're planning a mission to Europa. Now, a couple years ago, um, using Hubble, some scientists thought they saw water plumes. Well, they did. They saw evidence of water plumes coming from the South Pole of Europa. Now this wasn't entirely surprising. The moon at the bottom is Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. It also has icy crust subsurface liquid ocean, uh, and it's erupting that liquid ocean uh, through a series of cracks in its surface. We've flown the Cassini spacecraft several times right through those plumes. That's why we know they're water. We also know there's silica in them, which would suggest these kind of bottom of the ocean volcanic eruptions. And we know there's organic molecules in them also. We don't know how complex they are because our mass spectrometer quantity isn't sophisticated enough to tell us uh, exactly what those molecules are. So those are our primary targets. Now, if Europa has those eruption plumes, we're pretty sure they're there. The problem is we don't know how often they erupt. 
So when you design a spacecraft, should you design it to fly through those plumes? But what if they only erupt every 20 or 30 years to design your spacecraft to collect liquid water or, you know, or ice that's being ejected and it's not there? So we're still struggling with that. So we're still working. We've got an instrument package for the mission, but we're still struggling for a landed component for the mission and also how do we sample potential clues. And then obviously the other part of our search with the artist's conception there in the upper left is trying to find habitable environments on planets around other stars. Uh, as you probably well know, Kepler in the last four years has discovered about 5,000 planet candidates around other stars, telling us because of the small area of, of the sky it's been looking at, that probably just about every star you see in the night sky has a planetary system around it. So the chances of there being a, a liquid planet, an Earth-like planet around another star are fairly high. We'll use the James Webb Space Telescope, which will launch in uh, two years. Two years, yeah, two years. Um, to start looking at the atmospheres of some of those planets around other stars. So we're a long way from being able to determine life on a planet around another star, but at least we'll be able to start answering the question of can we find potentially habitable environments on planets around other stars. But again, right now our focus is on this journey, journey to Mars. So how are we going to do this? It's extremely complex. Our focus right now is on the International Space Station. What can we do? How can we use the International Space Station to get ready to send humans into deep space? Then we're going to move out to the vicinity of the moon, where you can still get home safely in about four days. So you can test capabilities, test technologies, and still have an escape route without committing to that eight-month journey, seven to eight-month journey to Mars, sometime there, that long journey back. So we really want to exercise. So we make sure we can get humans safely there, not leave them there, of course, um, and then bring them home safely. And in the meantime, we're carrying out our robotic exploration of Mars. What are the questions we need to answer at Mars to get ready to send humans there? And to continue to try to push this question of, is there, has there ever been life on Mars? We've obviously landed, um, I think, eight times on the surface of Mars. These are just five of the different sites we've landed. And again, what's driven us on Mars is this thing we call follow the water. What is the history of water? Can we identify potentially habitable environments? And now we're already really starting to think, how can we use the scientific data that we as an international community have been collecting to start thinking about where would we send humans? And obviously then planetary protection comes in because you know, we had this uh, recent discovery of looking at these RSLs, these, um, these uh, lineaments that come down the edges of some slopes where there seems to be some evidence that there's actually melting liquid water briefly on the surface. That's a, pre that's a potential, even though the water's nasty, you know, perchlorate's not a great place for life. On the other hand, that's a potentially, uh, currently, you know, you could have Mars microbes living in that water. So how do you explore those regions, which we classify as an international community, as special regions on Mars, ones that are, do have the potential for current life? How do we do that in a way that protects Mars from forward contamination, as well as worrying about backward contamination once we bring samples, and then eventually humans back. You can't bake a human, you can bake a sample, not so much a human. So robotically, we've been on, again, as an international community, focusing on characterizing Mars. What's the environment? What's the atmosphere like? How does Mars' atmosphere interact uh, with the solar wind? Um, and, and again, trying to always push this question of can we identify organic molecules on the surface that might lead us to believe that Mars did have past life. Um, most of you know our insight, the Mars seismometer experiment um, has now been delayed from 2016 due to problems with the instrument um, and we're still in the process of deciding um, how and when that, that might eventually uh, get off. And then the next focus is the Mars 2020 rover and beyond that we're still working to try to define what will happen after 2020. Uh, robotically. But certainly one of the chief questions we have again is this issue of where is the water on Mars? And that's important not only in understanding the question of life, the possibility of current life, but the question of using water as a potential resource uh, for astronauts on the surface. Um, 
drinking water, people like to talk about that. I'm always a bit more skeptical due to this whole, you know, Mars microbe issue. Would we really let an astronaut drink Mars water? I'm not so convinced of that. Um, but in terms of also potentially using water in the future as a resource for rocket fuel, you can obviously also extract oxygen from the atmosphere. That's another potential resource for um, in situ uh, resource utilization. But understanding the distribution of water on Mars uh, at the current time is a, is a really important data set in terms, again, where are we going to land on Mars with humans? How, what do we need to do between now and then to get ready? And then you start looking at all the other factors. For example, one of the chief things we worry about is actually Mars depth, dust. When the astronauts went up to the moon, um, they got dust all over their suits. They got back <coughs> in the capsule, they went back towards the Earth, they got into zero gravity. All that dust went airborne. Um, and they were inhaling it. So obviously they were all fine, it didn't affect them. On the other hand, we know Mars, some of the Mars soil is, is pretty nasty. So how can we make sure we understand the electrostatic properties of it so that we can make sure our astronauts are protected, our equipment is protected um, from the very fine dust that blows all around the surface of Mars. So that's something we need to continue to make measurements on. All the aspects that you need, the radiation environment characterized on the surface to understand for astronaut health uh, it is another critical factor of things that we need to continue to measure before we're ready to send humans there. There's still debate in the scientific community. Do you really need to bring a sample back before we send humans? And, and the community is actually fairly divided. So what are we doing to get humans ready? Every day on the International Space Station, every astronaut that goes up there um, becomes part of our end, our, our cohort of people who've been exposed to microgravity so that we can understand the, long, the effects on humans. Most of you probably know the effects are fairly, fairly dramatic. You know, you lose cardiovascular system function, you lose immune system function, your bones lose density, your muscles waste, you know, and for most people you're like, okay, that's enough to keep me home. Um, but you know, that's not the right answer. We want to move humans out. So we have to find ways to mitigate these effects. So that's our chief goal right now on the International Space Station. And they, you know, I hate to praise a PowerPoint chart, but you know, the, the human health people have this great chart where they've taken all the effects that happen to humans and they say, okay, how can we use the next 10 or so years we have the International Space Station to develop mitigations to make sure we can keep humans healthy for long duration in space. Now part of that for the last year has been the one year increment. So most astronauts go up for six months or less um, since, well, they're coming down in March. So for about nine and a half months, we've had two astronauts, Mikhail Kornienko, the cosmic, Russian cosmonaut, and Scott Kelly, uh, our American astronaut, have, have been on the ISS. For the US, this is a record. We've never had anyone in space for that long. Uh, the Russians had, when they had Mir, they had several people stay up, I think, for as long as 500 and some days. So with all the modern ways we have to analyze humans, having this data set from this one-year increment has been incredibly valuable. What happens to all those health effects after six months? Do they plateau? You know, do they get worse? Do they get better? How do our mitigations that we've been developing, like about an hour and a half of exercise a day, keeps your muscles and your bones in pretty good shape? Does that, does that work going beyond six months? So those are the kind of questions we're analyzing uh, with Scott and McCott. We have the added benefit that Scott Kelly has a twin brother, Mark Kelly, who used to be an astronaut. And Mark very generously agreed that all the tests we run on Scott up on the ISS, we run on Mark on the ground. We have about 10 different investigations. And you know, people will challenge me and say, what is the good of one twin study? And I say, well, it's better than zero twin studies. Um, because you know, a lot of the effects, whether it's for plants, whether it's for humans, up in microgravity, you get genes changing their behavior in response to the lack of gravity. So these, uh, these effects are taking place at a really fundamental level. So like one of my favorite uh, experiments they're doing on both Scott and Mark are looking at how their gut biome is changing over this one year period. How does that react uh, in microgravity as opposed to being on the ground? So interesting studies um, in the twin study. And then obviously huge questions for getting humans to go, you know, go beyond just health, mental health, nutrition. Uh, and that's why this past year we grew lettuce on the space station and ate it. We just had some flowers bloom up in space with the idea of how do you keep fresh food on that long journey to Mars? You know, most food is not shelf stable uh, for three years. Most pharmaceuticals are not shelf stable for that long. And that, those things then have benefit to us here on Earth. 
you know, having long-term stable pharmaceuticals benefits developing countries around the world and in countries where increasingly it's becoming harder to grow food, thinking about how you grow food under extreme conditions like in microgravity is important. So how are we going to do this on a practical level? So again, using the ISS right now is the experiment. <coughs> Let's use the ISS to get ready to go to Mars in every aspect. Even to the point, for example, eventually we're going to do some experiments of just delaying it's about a 15 minute lag in communication time. We're used to really staying on top of our astronauts, always chattering back and forth with them. Let's do some experiments inducing large <coughs> communication time lag and see, see what kind of effects it has. The astronauts will probably love it, not having these people <laughs> bugging them all the time. So this is where we are right now. Commercial cargo and crew are a critical part of this. We want to start partnering more and more. Again, limited budget. How can we partner with the commercial sector? Orbital, SpaceX, and now um, Sierra Nevada Corporation take cargo for the U.S. up and down to the International Space Station. And starting in about two years, Boeing and SpaceX will start launching astronauts from U.S. soil. Again, let's get the commercial sector involved. Let's give them things that, that you know, don't require NASA anymore. Let's turn those over to the private sector. <coughs> We're developing a new rocket and a capsule to go on top of it, the Space Launch System and the Orion Capsule. That will get us out beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, the capsule, the Orion Capsule, can take about six astronauts for two to three weeks. So it is not the vehicle that will get us to Mars. It's what will get us to the vehicle that will get us to Mars. So then we need to work on that. And just in our budget that just came out, we have the first steps of working on a deep space HAV module. That is the vehicle that will get us to Mars. So the Orion will rendezvous with that, deliver the crew. We're going to test that vehicle out in lunar orbit, uh, and then get ready to eventually send it on to Mars. Deep space propulsion. We're going to test with the asteroid redirect mission. We're laying plans for robotic precursor missions that we'll do in the 2020s at Mars, uh, and then eventually be ready to say, OK, it's the 2030s. We've tested all these capabilities. We're ready to go to Mars. So we've divided it up into three regions, what we call Earth Reliant, where we're, now we're doing the bulk of the work in the 2020s, we'll move out to the proving ground before we're ready for humans to be in this really Earth independent mode, where you really have to say, okay, you're going, and you're coming back for about three years, and we have to make sure we're ready for that. So what kind of, of choices do we make? What are the options? So when you look at this as an architecture, there are lots of different paths you can take. There are lots of different options. Do we go to Mars orbit first? Do we go right for the surface? Do we instead maybe try to land on one of Mars's moons? How much do we really need to test at the, at, at the moon? What can we test here on the Earth? So this is the trade space that we're working with right now. And, and when you look at some of these things, we clearly have things we haven't yet learned. You know, the Mars Curiosity rover weighed one metric ton. And for those of you who have seen the seven minutes of terror video from JPL, you know, I never thought that landing system would work, frankly. I was like, ah, I can't watch this. You know, you know retro rockets, parachutes, sky crane, one metric ton. We estimate for humans on the surface of Mars, we're going to need about 40 metric tons. We don't know how to do that. How much can you modularize it? Do we, are we sure we have enough data on Mars' atmosphere to understand? Obviously, you've really got to know the state of the atmosphere when you're trying to bring that much mass in. Do we understand the surface of Mars to understand where it's safe to land and where it's not safe to land? So all of these things are questions that we're trying to figure out. How do we answer these in the 2020s to get ready for the 2030s? And what can we do with our international partners? What are our international partners saying? You know, yeah, we, we want to go do that. We're interested maybe in in-situ resource utilization. Or we're interested in Mars' Mars's atmosphere. Or we're interested in spacecraft autonomy. So NASA, you don't have to worry about that. So some of the things we're primarily trying to do right now is this issue I mentioned, communications with increased delay to the space station, human health, New spacesuits, which obviously your, your uh, astronaut was involved in, uh, in uh, testing uh, just up on the, uh, the space station. Um, huge questions we have about low G. You know, now at this point, after more than a decade, we know a lot about microgravity and we know a lot about 1G. We don't know much about the long term effects of being in low G, like you would have on the surface of the moon, like you would have on the surface of Mars. 
Lots of questions about that that we need to answer. So an awful lot to do. And again, this is where our international partnerships become so critical. So we're trying to split it into sort of broader character categories. Again, trying to say, what does NASA need to do? What can ESA do? What might Ross Cosmos be interested in doing? How is an international space community? What is Denmark interested in doing? Um, and you, you can put it into these different categories. Obviously, transportation is still one of the critical ones. We're spending a lot of money on solar electric propulsion as kind of a cargo mode of propulsion to get stuff that you're going to need back and forth. Too slow for humans. Um, I always tell when I go, especially I go talk to young kids, I'm like, would one of you please invent warp drive because we really need it? Um, you know, we're obviously, as you well know, still basically using propulsion systems um, from the, the 1960s. So we don't move fast enough. So how can we get humans through space so they're in that deep space radiation environment for smaller amounts of time? Um, crew health, I keep coming back to that, but that crew health is so critical. So certainly the radiation environment uh, is something we're paying an awful lot of attention to. But I think it's worth it. And, and you know, I always tell audiences, if it's not the science, if I don't, you know, if, if you're totally unmoved by the fact that we are on the verge of understanding, are we alone in our solar system? Did life evolve beyond Earth? If that, if that leaves you cold, I don't care. Um, you know, think about the fact that there are estimates that for about every dollar invested in NASA, about $4 is returned to, to the U.S. economy. And, and at times, I think, people have this vision that NASA launches. There was a cartoon from one of our satirical newspapers that said, there goes NASA launching money into space again. You know, it was a rocket with dollar bills trailing behind it. You know, when you invest in the space industry, you invest in, in your country's capabilities. You invest in technology. You spur innovation that trickles throughout the rest of the economy. And so I think while Mars is the goal, I, I think what you ever, never can forget is that we're in making all these investments right here on this planet and helping to move this planet forward. So our focus right now is we have been Martians. You know, we've been Martians since 1976 when the Viking landers landed on Mars. But I want to see us in 20 years go to that next step. I want geologists, I want astrobiologists, I want chemists. I want people from all around the world, I want women, on the surface of Mars, becoming the new Martians. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for a truly inspiring and very exciting talk. I hope you stay and uh, answer a few questions, yes. if there are any questions from the, the audience. I like questions, but I don't really like talking, so I'll get there a lot of Any questions? What's the uh, current status of the asteroid redirect mission, and do you foresee that being a, an important part of humans um, you know, visiting the, an asteroid as a stepping stone, or is that kind of getting you know, re, reworked? Um, we continue to work on the asteroid redirect mission. The most critical part of the asteroid redirect mission, where we've actually been putting our focus over the last bunch of years, is on that solar electric propulsion part, because we know we need SEP. We need advanced SEP beyond what we've tested um, in space so far. Um, so we continue to work on it. It continues to be a focus. Obviously, it wasn't necessarily warmly received um, beyond NASA, um, but, but I think that's that's starting to change, and I, I think as we've made sure that we understand that for people it is not a science mission, it, it's a technology demonstration mission that you will get some asteroid science from, um, that that's the focus of it. And there's also an element of it where when we're at the asteroid, we would do some experiments on um, asteroid deflection um, that people are concerned obviously about planet, a different kind of planet, planetary defense. I always model planetary protection and planetary defense. Um, so I, I think there are aspects of that mission that we are, we are certainly continuing to work on, um, and we're still optimistic of, of getting the mission off in the 2020s. Now that's the asteroid portion. This work we're doing on the deep space habitat that we're beginning to do, having humans out in what we call a lunar distant retrograde orbit, the kind of big loopy orbit around the moon, um, in a deep space hat, 
Um, that's where when you brought the sample back, you would bring it back to those astronauts. So we're also working on that human part uh, of the mission. And, and again, the point of this is to just start exercising these capabilities that you need um, in a safer place to get ready to go to Mars. Thank you. In your timeline, it seems that the International Space Station would cease to operate by mid-2025, uh, sort of and the Mars expedition would be some, something like uh, 2030 <coughs> or 2035. Would there be something in between there to keep human in space continuously? Um, at, at NASA, we feel pretty strongly about having a <coughs> continuous human presence in space. So I think it's, <coughs> it, it's critical. I know in this country you've seen the enormous um, response you've gotten to, to having a Danish astronaut. And I, I think we all understand that a, a lot of NASA's support comes from support of the Human Exploration Program. Um, so I, I think most estimates are the space station probably can't last much longer than 2028 at, at, at most. We've extended it to 2024. You know, at some point, the larger systems on the space station, especially the solar panels, um, you know, it's no longer going to be viable, and obviously you have to do a controlled re-entry of the space station. It's, I mean, some people would like it to last forever, but it's definitely not going to. And obviously for NASA, we also want to take that wedge of our budget that goes to the space station, and we want to start spending that on going to Mars. So, you know, at some point, I don't know if it's going to be 2024, 25, 26, uh, what we will at that point want to make sure that we have this deep space habitat in LDRO so that our astronauts would be moving from low Earth orbit out towards the moon uh, and then to Mars. And, and I think that continuity is important because of all these research reasons, these pushing the capabilities, the pushing the capabilities. When you have gaps, you also risk losing your skills here on Earth um, that are so critical to making sure we can do this safely. So that's, that's definitely our goal. What we're hoping is that as governments leave low Earth orbit, the commercial sector comes in behind us. Um, and, and obviously when you have companies like, like SpaceX, like Boeing going with commercial crew, um, you've got all these other companies that are interested in suborbital flights or, or you know, pushing, pushing even beyond that. Will there be commercial space stations at that point? Will they be human tended? Will they not? Um, I think these are questions. So a lot of our focus for what we're doing on the ISS when we're not focused on all the journey to Mars stuff that I've talked about, we're really trying to say, how can, is there anything we can do to help spur commercial interest in low Earth orbit? Are we doing the right kinds of research? Are we partnering with, with companies? Are, are we trying to spur innovation in low Earth orbit that might help make sure that the uh, the commercial sector comes in behind us. And we're going to be doing in this coming year this experiment called BEAM, which is with the Bigelow Corporation, where they're going to be doing an inflatable module test. And, and you know, his aim is, is moving towards a commercial space station. I have a, I have a question in just a second. <laughs> how, how, how do you think a country like Denmark can contribute to the journey to Mars? And what is the benefit of NASA collaborating with a country like Denmark in, in such an endeavor? You know, I really can't say enough times, we can't do this on our own. We, you know, we need, you know, first of all, the best minds in the world are not all, you know, are not located in the U.S. They're located all over the world. They're in Denmark. They're in Europe. Um, they're in Asia. So, so we need to tap the potential of this whole planet in order to do something really complex. And, and I want to emphasize, tap the, you know, the potential of the entire planet. If we only have guys working on this, we're not going to accomplish what we need to accomplish. It's so important that we get women and underrepresented groups um, to help participate in science, technology, engineering, and math, because you're not tapping into the potential of our entire population to solve these great problems. And, and you know, so it goes for all of us in all countries. And I think when you break this, this problem up of all these steps, which is what we've been trying to do, is to say, okay, when you you know, big problems. I'm going to send humans to Mars. Let's break it up into individual steps and then say to different countries around the world, this is what NASA has been doing, where would you like to contribute? Where do you see your expertise? Is it a, is it a capability, a specific technology? And then let's talk and let's say, because for us to be able to say, okay, we're going to turn this aspect of going to Mars, whether it's, again, 
just to pick something, institute resource utilization, or it might be some aspect of autonomy, measurements to understand what's going on with radiation, you know, whatever it is. And it actually even doesn't matter how small it is, because then that's resources NASA can take and spend on something that nobody else wants to do or that we have expertise in. And so right now I'd say between the effort with the Global Exploration Roadmap and the NASA talking about partners around the world, and that's partially why I'm here in Denmark, is to say, first of all, are you interested at all in, in, in doing this? And then where do you see yourself? And let's keep talking and try to figure out what the best uh, collaborative roles are. Uh, because we can't do it by ourselves. And, and I'm really... I'm really passionate about this. You know, I, ever since I was a kid, my father worked for NASA. You know, we've been talking about sending humans to Mars, you know, since I was a kid. And I think we have the ability through international collaboration, through partnering with the private sector, we have the ability to make this happen. But it, it has to be we. It, it it can't be just us. Thank you so much for that invitation. Do you need the mic? Uh, perhaps. Speak up. Hi, I'm from the Danish uh, Broadcasting Corporation. We have a live server from this, uh, uh, and we have a question from uh, Stephen Detlefsen. He asked, "How much money do you think that it will cost to go to to take human to Mars? And has NASA ever thought of doing crowdfunding for it?" <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's quite more money than crowdfunding would get us. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we have not, at this point, put a price tag because we're still trying to understand what I call the architectural space. You know, obviously you want to start with saying what's the minimum path we can take? And what does that first step have to be? Do we, do we land on Mars? Do we just orbit maybe rendezvous with, with the sample container coming up from the surface? So you have to start with kind of what's the minimum architecture try to understand how that costs, and then as, as you think you might have money, try to add back in. But one thing NASA's focused on is understanding that our budget is not going to go hugely up. Our, our budget is basically the budget we have. You know, there's too many governments all around the world. You know, there's, there's a lot of pressures on, on governments from various areas. So you have to say, you, you know, we can't live in a, in a dream world where we think our budget's going to greatly increase to accomplish this. And that's why the international collaboration is important. So we, we don't have a, a price tag yet because we're still trying to understand the architecture uh, and trying to understand an architecture that fits, you know, with the budget that we have. And, and that's our aim, is, is to do it with the money we have. So crowdfunding is, might be good for some smaller aspects of it, but for the whole thing, it's going to take more than that. We have one more question. This is from um, Stephen Tion. Uh, he wants to know if the Mars expedition uh, would be a question of science or it's a kind of uh, who's coming first. Well, you, you know, to me, it, I hope and I believe that it will be a question of science. The, the questions we're trying to answer at Mars, to me, are so fundamental. Um, and I think it's one that, that resonates with the public. Um, about about a year ago, I made the huge mistake of, of making a specific prediction, um, and I got misworded. But what I said was, within a decade, we were going to find indications, strong indications of life on uh, beyond Earth. And but but what I meant by that was actually on on Mars, not for extrasolar planets. And I got quoted in, in People magazine, which in the United States is like our you know fluffy you know movie star. Kind of thing. <laughs> and you're like. The public is actually interested in this. This resonates with the public. And I think sometimes people underestimate, oh, the public isn't interested in science. So there's not broad support for this. But I really think there is. I think people want to know, are we alone? It's such a fundamental question. And so I do believe that science will be the driver. Um, there will be other drivers, but science will be there. Um, I have a question. I was wondering if there's a question for future. So a question for the future beyond 2030. Let's assume we have enough money, so this is not a problem. Uh, where do you think should be the next stop for humankind beyond Mars? 
Well, I guess for me it's hard to think beyond Mars because when you think about this realistically, um, trying to understand, did, do, can we find you know, indications of life on Mars? First of all, to get the scientific community to agree on that. You know, people like to think that scientific, scientists all agree with each other, we all know the truth, we love to argue with each other and prove each other wrong. Getting the scientific community to have consensus that what we have found is indeed evidence of past life is going to be a huge struggle because it's probably not going to look like life here on Earth. Does it have cell structure like ours? Does it have RNA and DNA like our, our life has? What are the implications of that for how life evolved here on this planet? That's going to take a lot of samples, a lot of rocks, a lot of geologists cracking open rocks, my specialty. Um, you know, on the surface of Mars. And, and so I'm sort of mired to me in my bias, which is the science we have to do at Mars is, is gonna be is gonna be big. There's a lot of work to be done at Mars and with the samples that we'll bring back from Mars. Moving humans out beyond Mars just becomes even more of a challenge. You know, the distances are so great. Um, you know, and a lot of people start talking about things like asteroid mining and, and using space more from a commercial perspective. I'm probably a little bit more of a skeptic on that side and saying it's going to be a while before that actually becomes commercially viable. Okay, final question. So you mentioned that uh, in the Apple era the GDP percentage was a lot greater allocated for NASA. So of course the finances was much less of an issue than it is right now. But uh, to my mind it also was a different attitude at that time because it was a space race and there was a high motivation uh, to go and achieve new frontiers. So do you think it's uh, the right attitude or maybe it's too cautious or actually on the, quite the opposite right now? Is it is it the right attitude, and do you think that uh, uh, maybe you could comment on uh, what should be done to actually find the right way to do it, to approach it, and uh, to get the goal done to go to Mars? No, it's Thank a you. great question, and, and I think if you go back, and, and obviously science, you know, I'm just saying, science is why we're going to go to Mars. Science was not why we went to the moon. You know, we got amazing science out of it. You know, so much of what we understand about the Earth-Moon system. You know, came from the science that we got from Apollo. So the science was rich, but it was by far not the driver of the program. Um, and, and I've had people say to me, oh, without that kind of space race, without that competition, this is never going to happen. But I would argue we're in such a different era right now. And I would say in this case, it's not competition, it's cooperation that is driving us forward. It, it's nations seeing the benefit of cooperation on the space station. It's saying, what can we do together moving outward? Because now countries see, when you invest in space, you invest in your economy, you invest in technology, you invest in innovation. So I think that international collaboration is actually moving us forward at a slower pace, albeit, than I would necessarily like, but, but it's moving us forward. The thing that I think is giving us the extra push that makes me really optimistic is the private sector. You know, obviously you have uh, groups like Mars One that, that have come forward. Um, you have Elon Musk at SpaceX saying he's going to go to Mars. He doesn't care if NASA is going to go or not. And I've heard him give speeches where he's like, I want to create a Mars economy. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm still skeptical of that. But now you have a whole different motivation. You have people who, who see who don't look at the Earth as the Earth economy, they're starting to look at it as, okay, now let's include lower Earth orbit in the Earth economy. Let's maybe include the moon. Let's maybe move that out to Mars. Let's broaden our definition of where humans work in space is. The head of the United Launch Alliance, um, Corey Bruno, I was on a panel with him, and he said in, in, in a decade we're going to see a thousand people living and working in space. Or maybe I'm still a little skeptical of that, but, but that's the kind of thinking that I think is driving us forward, and I, I think it's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Stofen, for a very interesting talk and for sharing your thoughts about the future of space flight with us. And I completely agree with the ambassador that we should also uh, remember the aspirations uh, we all too often dwell into our 
daily life and travel. So keeping the aspirations in mind is uh, extremely important. And uh, thank you for for doing that and helping uh, with focus on this aspect of Stofan. So thank you very much, Dr. Stofan, and uh, the ambassador for the introduction. Thank you.